I hope you are not easily offended. Um, because if you are, you may as well go ahead and leave or turn it off or whatever. Don't watch. Like, because if, if, if there was ever a Sunday when I was going to offend you, it's probably today. And I'll just tell you that up front. You're all going to be mad and go home upset. Like, it just... One of the joys of teaching uh, verse by verse through a book of the Bible is that it forces me to deal with the difficult text. One of the awful parts of teaching verse by verse through a book of the Bible is that it forces me to deal with the difficult text. And you know, If you topically teach, you can just skip around and go, hey, um, oh, that's hard. I'm just going to go past. And nobody knows the difference because you talk three verses over here, three verses like, and I prefer to walk through a book of the Bible. So we're in John. We've been in John since the fall. We're going to be in John until Christmas probably. And now we get to John. We're in John chapter 12. Um, and, uh, and the text gets a little harder. So we're, this is uh, uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, I have, I've had hours this week to ponder, meditate on, and try to squirm out of uh, this particular text. And, it, and I have failed at every turn. So... Um, so here we are. We're going to be in John uh, chapter 12. We're going to begin in verse 20 uh, and uh, work down through 36. I think. John chapter 20, beginning or John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These men came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, "Sir." We wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. My soul has become troubled. And what, I, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came, for this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by heard it were saying it thundered. Others were saying an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for yours. Now judgment is upon the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. And the crowd answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ is to remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Jesus answered and said to them, For a little while, longer, the light is among you. Walk while you have light, so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke, and then he went away and hid himself. Would you pray with me, Father in heaven, uh, as we try to unpack this text and what it means for our daily life, I pray that you'd speak through these ancient words. Uh, Lord, I pray that they would be as relevant today as the day they were written. I pray that you would help us to apply them in incredibly tangible and practical ways, and that you would use them to transform us into the image of Christ. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. That on the surface, this seems pretty straightforward. Like, until we get to the middle and then we start to unpack it and we're like, oh, okay, we're in trouble. So uh, follow along with me. Verse 20, let's just unpack it. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. And these men came to Philip. Like, who are the Greeks? Like, the Greeks are God-fearers. So they're coming to worship at the feast in Jerusalem. Passover is coming. Like, and throughout Israel's history, there has been a group of people who were non-Jews who, con who, because of the influence of Judaism, converted to the worship of Yahweh. Everywhere Israel went, 
Some people from the natives, like from the non-Jewish people converted. Ruth is a great example, right? Ruth's the Moabitess, and she says, your God will be my God. Like, and she converts. She's actually in the line of Jesus, but she's a Moabitess. She's, not a, like, she's a God-fearer, okay? So she becomes a worshiper of Yahweh. And there, throughout Israel's history, have been a group of people who were God-fearers, who were non-Jews who converted to Judaism. And followed the teachings of the law, and they came to worship at the Passover. And it's so prevalent that even in the temple, there's a court of the Gentiles where the Gentiles can worship. Okay, so this is the non-Jews. So these Greeks are coming, and these are Greek converts to Judaism, and they're coming for Passover. Now, it's interesting because they come to Philip. Like, and Philip is kind of an interesting character. We don't know a ton about him. Uh, we do know that he is a, we know that Philip's from uh, Bethsaida of Galilee, which is the same as Peter and Andrew. Uh, what we know about Philip is he's one of two apostles who have a Greek name. Like, so Philip is not a Hebrew name. Uh, Philip, I mean, uh, is, is, in essence, it, it's a Greek name that means lover of horses. Okay, that's not, that's not, a, that's not a Jewish name. Uh, so in all likelihood, even though Philip is from Galilee, he's a half-breed, okay? So Philip is probably like Timothy. He probably has a Jewish mother and a Greek father and a Greek name. He looks Greek. He doesn't look like a Hebrew, okay? He, his skin tone's a little different. His complexion's different. His beard is like mine. doesn't grow, you know what I mean? Like, the, the, he looks different. And so the Greeks approach Philip because he's one of Jesus' disciples, but he looks like them. Like, he has the appearance of a Greek. Like, and he's still one of Jesus' followers. So this group of Greeks come up and say, can we see Jesus too? I mean, the question here is, can we see him? Like, we know that Jesus claims to be the Jewish Messiah. They've heard the rumors. They've heard the, the rumbles through the temple. And they, is this for us too? Can, can, can we meet Jesus? And Philip brings them to Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip come to Jesus. And, of course, you can meet Jesus. There's no barrier based on race, okay? There's, everybody comes to Jesus the same, regardless of whether they're slave or free man, Jew or Greek. Like, everybody can come to Jesus. And so this group of Greeks come to Jesus and Jesus teaching to them, uh, it, he, te he gives them a parable. But it's absolutely life-changing, incredibly important, and I want to unpack the parable. Verse 23, they, the, the Greeks come to Jesus and he answers them. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Like, uh, this is an agricultural analogy. Now, understand that in the first century, most people are farmers, and everybody's pretty close to the earth. Like, we live in a society where lots of kids don't know that tomatoes come from plants, that they come from the grocery store, okay? If you ask a kid, where does a bread come from? They go, from the grocery store? I mean, because we are so divorced from agriculture in most of American culture that lots of kids don't know where their food comes from. Like, the, so understand, this is the nature of a seed, like, it's a grain of wheat. And Jesus uses this picture because a grain of wheat dies. And if you've ever played with a grain of wheat or popcorn, like played with some seeds, they're a little hard, dead, nothing. Uh, and unless it dies, Jesus said, and it, it remains alone. Unless it dies, it, it's going to stay just a single kernel of wheat, a single seed. That's it. Now, I've got some seeds. I planted some this year trying to bring back a variety that had been sitting in my drawer for six years. Been laying in my little seed box for six years. They sprouted. Hey, I'm excited. Um, and they've been alone laying in the box for six years, bearing nothing, not bringing any fruit. Just a dead seed. But if it falls into the earth and dies... It bears much fruit. Like, now, when, when you watch you plant a little grain of wheat, it grows up and it produces not just one. It's not a one-to-one, -one, right? It dies and it comes back and it bears much grain. 
Like my one little tomato seed will bear 10 pounds of tomatoes or 20 or 30, depending on the plant. Um, one wheat seed is going to bear a, a, a whole bush, uh, not a bushel, but a whole head of wheat. Um, a single, anybody that played with Tahitian melon squash? A single plant, single Tahitian melon squash will produce anywhere from 100 to 150 pounds of squash from one plant. It's a crazy thing. Um, like one little bitty seed. It bears much fruit, but it has to die first. And Jesus obviously here is telling, is speaking about the kind of death that he's going to die. That he's going to die, he's going to be buried in the tomb for three days. And as a result of that resurrection, he's going to bear fruit to eternal life. But verse 25 is where it gets hard for us. Because he says, he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. Um, I have spent most of the week just, just, just on that verse. I mean, just kind of trying to unpack that. I mean, what does it actually mean that he who loves his life loses it? And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. Like, I, that, there's a lot here. I mean, and, and it's hard because, I mean, well, does that mean I have to hate everything? What does it mean I have to lose? Like, what does it actually mean to lose my life? What does it mean to lose my life? I mean, what does it mean to die to myself? So the parallel texts talk, use the language die to self. That Jesus said, if any man would come after me, he must die to himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And we live in the age of look out for number one. We live in 21st century America. Your responsibility is to look out for yourself. Look out for number one. But you can't look out for number one and be a Christian. I mean, that's not how faith in Jesus works. You can't look out for number one and be a Christian. Jesus says you have to die to yourself, which means look out for who? Philippians 2 says don't look, do nothing from selfish ambition, but look out for the interest of others. Like that we're supposed to be like Jesus and look out for the interest of others. Like, we're supposed to die to ourselves. You know, and I started unpacking this and meditating on it. Like, like what does self-denial actually look like? Okay, like, almost always, it looks like, it's almost always bound in relationship. Okay, so self-denial is almost always bound inside relationships. Like, it's really, really, really easy to deny yourself if you go be a hermit. Like, if you move to Alaska and live off the grid in one of the little sheds, like, you don't have to worry about self-denial. I mean, you only got one person to take care of. You don't have, like, if, as soon as you introduce relationship, self-denial becomes an unfortunate necessity. Like, as soon as you get married, um, okay, now I have to take care of not just myself, and I have to take care of my spouse. All right. Uh, as soon as you add kids, now I got to take care of my children, and I, all of that requires self denial. And so I was, in in big categories, it's two things. Like, if you identify how you spend your time and how you spend your money, I mean, all of my examples as I was meditating on this week are either time or money. Like, because in this world, there's nothing more valuable than time. I can always make more money. Uh, however, like how I spend my money is often indicative of what I value. And when we talk about self-denial, when Jesus talks about loving your life in this life, you go, okay, wait a minute. You're supposed to lose your life. Like, what's it mean to lose your life? What's it mean to hate the life in this world? Like, it clearly doesn't mean that I hate my spouse. I love her. It clearly doesn't mean I hate my children. Like, it means that I love Jesus supremely. And it means that everything else following Jesus. Jesus says in the next verse, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And that means we're talking about following Jesus' example of self-denial. So how do you do that in relationship? Like, and I, okay, in marriage, like I'm going to start there. Like maybe I should start with a single guy at the back, but like, or single kids over here. Like, no, I'll, I'll start in marriage. Like husbands, when it says love your wives as Christ loved the church, it's talking about in a manner of self-denial. It means that you serve her before you serve yourself. 
It means you put her needs in front of yours every time. That means like, if you're having this conversation in the middle of the night about who gets to sleep, you go let your wife go to sleep. Uh, if there's a diaper that needs to be changed, husbands, get up and go change the diaper. It means you serve your wife. Like, it means you put her needs in front of your own. You know what people fight about at home? Have you ever watched a couple fight about who gets control of the remote? Like, I mean, they fight about this. Uh, oh, they, they do it uh, under their breath. They joke and they elbow and they move And they argue about who has control of the remote. Husbands, this should be a non-issue. You should always give it up. Your wife should always have control of the remote. Like, why? Because you're supposed to deny yourself. Uh, ultimately, she's supposed to deny herself, too, and that y'all should be able to agree. I mean, that's, that's the point. Like, but, I think, in our relationships, it's are we denying ourselves? And so, like, how do you do that? Okay, how are you spending your time? Like, if you're working too much, like, uh, if you spend all of your time at work, like, but no time with your wife, like, you're not serving her well. If you spend all of your time at work and, the, okay, well, I worked my 40 hours and now I'm really tired. And so I'm going to come home and I'm going to crash on the couch and I'm going to turn on my device, whatever that happens to be. Turn on your phone, turn on your screen, turn on your TV, watch your March Madness or whatever. Like, and what you really need to be doing is engaging with your child or children who really need some attention because they've been in school all day like, or the wife has been home with them all day. Like, and you walk in the door and like... I'm just tired. I'm going to plop in my chair, put my feet up, and I'm going to zone out. I'm going to watch this. That's not self-denial. Like, the, the, if you want to know if you're denying yourself, if you begin the thought with, I want, the answer is generally no. I want to is an incredibly dangerous phrase. Because I want, does it mean I can't ever want anything? No. It means that you have to evaluate every I want in light of, am I going to die to myself? You have to evaluate every I want in relation. I, I just want to chill out. I just want some quiet. I just want a break. Okay? Like, you got to evaluate that in light of, am I being, am I denying myself? Like, couples don't typically fight over where they eat out. There's all sorts of disagreement on it. But I don't care. I don't care. Like, the husband's like, I, don't, I really don't care. Well, the wife says, I don't care either. And you say, how about, she gives you six read, nope, 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 and nope. I'm like, okay, so we've eliminated all the places you don't want to go. Um, is there anyone, you, I don't care where we eat. Well, except you already gave me six. Like, there are places in our lives where we get to deny ourselves. Like, and time is a huge one. So are we spending time with those that matter? Like, are we spending time on ourselves? Like where, okay, if I've got free time, this is what I'm doing. I'm investing it in myself. Or am I spending my free time investing in the lives of others? But I don't know any lost people. I don't know anybody that doesn't know Jesus. Okay, this is convicting because I'm wrestling with this in the middle of the night to myself. I'm going, all right, like how much of my time do I give to people that don't know Jesus? Like how much of my time do I invest in relationships with people that are far away from Christ and need to hear the gospel? Like, it's easy to invest, for me, real time with my wife and children. Like, it's easy for me to invest relationally in them. Like, it's much harder for me to invest relationally in others. And so I have this, this tension that exists where I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. I'm supposed to live a life of self-denial. At what point does that mean? It might mean I don't get much free time. Because I have responsibilities to take care of and children to take care of and work to take care of. But it means beyond that, all right, now here's my free time. Am I going to spend it in isolation? Or am I going to spend that free time investing in the lives of others? Am I going to spend it reaching out to a lost person? Am I going to spend it reaching out to a family that really needs to be encouraged? Like, that's what self-denial starts to look like. It starts to go, okay, like when it comes to finances, and I mean, we're doing financial peace right now at church. On Sunday nights. So let me just tell you, uh, finances create tension in marriage. All right, they just do, and that's okay because we're learning how to do them together. But when you have one spouse who has a budget, and this is our budget for the month, and this is how much money we make, and this is how much we can spend, and you have another spouse who goes, that's nice, and spends whatever they want on whatever they want, like that budget does not work, okay? And the, the spouse who is the spender 
is not loving their wife or their husband in a way that Christ loves the church. They are not living a life of self-denial. Like you can't you can't go, oh yeah, that's fine. Like we have eight hundred dollars to eat out this month, or we have three hundred dollars to eat out this month and go spend five hundred dollars eating out. You can't do that and love others. You can't love your wife well in that context. Like and and we do. So the world says look out for number one. Relationally, like that's really hard to look out for others all the time. Like, I have watched marriages di divorce and disintegrate when the spouse said, I want, I want to be treated this way all the time. And she doesn't treat me this way. And I found this person over here and they treat me that way. And so I'm leaving to go be with this person because God wants me to be happy. Okay. That's, that's sinful. Like that's not true. Like, what God wants for you is your holiness. What God wants for you is to die to your desires and serve your spouse. Like, and that's hard for people today. That's hard for us going, no, I, my spouse is unkind. My spouse is not treating me the way I want to be treated. Like, he has a, an anger problem. Okay? Like, I, I'm not denying that those things are reality. Like, those things happen. We all have sin issues. And some of them are huge. Like, but as a Spouse, I'm called to love you without expectation of reciprocity, without, you expe without expecting that you're going to love me in return. I'm supposed to lay down my life for you. Like, and it's easy for us to kind of understand this in the context of relationship. Like as a parent, it's easy to go, well, I can see I have to lay down my life for my kids because I have to give up my screen time so that I can read to them. I have to give up my basketball watching time so that I can pour into them and I can listen to their stories and their chats and I can engage with them at their level. Like and th that part's easy. Like we are conditioned. All of us have a, a family group and we, okay, we, it's easy to love people in our families. Like it gets harder if you turn this down because Jesus doesn't just love his family. Jesus goes all the way to say, you need to love your enemies. Like, and, and in Matthew 7, he says, you know, you've heard it said, but I say to you, like, you're supposed to love your enemies. Like, okay, well, what does it look like to love our enemies? Like, if we're going to deny ourselves and lose our life, it means that our posture and our attitude towards our enemies ought to be one that is loving. Like, in the political arena... This looks like you should never call the other side names. I don't care what side you're on. That's not loving. Like, you should never model that behavior for your kids. Like, you should never demean a person in authority regardless of whether or not you agree with them. Like, what it means is you should, like, we have this kind of really nationalistic thing, and I'm going to dance on some people's toes and I'll try to be gentle. Like, but we kind of have this nationalist thing right now going on in our country where we don't want people from outside because they're the enemy. They look different from us. They're bringing a culture that's different from ours. They bring a language that's different from ours. Like, and they might be terrorists and they might blow us up. Okay? And so we can say, well, this is different because this is, this, is, this, is this is our country. Like, I'm sorry, Jesus doesn't distinguish. Okay? The, the, the call to self-denial doesn't, doesn't affect your politics. Like, it, it, sh it should. Like, you should be denying yourself in regards. Well, we can't afford those people. And I, I'm speaking to the party that my family is affiliated with, okay? Like, that we can't afford those things. Okay. Like, ultimately, that's a, I'm being selfish with my money and I don't want my taxes raised. And I, I don't care what issue we're talking about, whether we're talking about health care or, what, like, I, I'm watching the public school disaster in, in the county in which I live right now over we can't raise taxes to fund education. Like, because I know new taxes, and that's driven ultimately by a selfishness. I don't want to pay more taxes because I don't, I don't value education. I don't value your kid's education. Like, it's not my kid, not my problem. Like, I can, like, and when Jesus applies this, this, this loving our life, like, sometimes we, we want to divorce those things and go, well, I, I, don't ha I can think differently when it comes to politics, or I can think differently when it comes to uh, local politics. No. Like, we're called to self-denial. Like, 
all the time. We don't get a pass. Like, we're called to go, I'm supposed to look out for the interest of others because that's what Jesus does. Jesus is always looking out for the interest of others. If he wasn't, he would not have gone to the cross. Okay? There's nothing appealing about self-denial because the other thing as we unpack this, dying to self can only be painful. It cannot be pleasant. Jesus doesn't die a pleasant death. Like, Jesus' followers are called to a life of self-denial, and that self-denial is going to be unpleasant and uncomfortable. And it might mean we're uncomfortable with people. It might mean we're uncomfortable with, uh, hey, wait, my taxes got raised because we needed to fund a new school or because we needed to fund health care. Like, it, like oh, that, that, I had to pay for that. It might be uncomfortable because I had to sacrificially give to send these kids on a mission trip because it's valuable for them to go and see the world and have a chance to share the gospel with people in parts of the world. Like, we give sacrificially to missions and the church. Like, sacrificially means it hurts. I mean, that's the, that's the sheer, that's the definition. Like, if it doesn't hurt, if it doesn't cost you something, it's not sacrificial. Like, and so Jesus says, he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. That I'm supposed to live with such a perspective that the only thing that matters is the souls of men. At the end of the day, it's the only thing that's eternal. Like, everything that I own is going to get burned up. My kids yesterday were down at the little museum. It was a Chester Inn downtown. And they were looking at a 200-year-old chair. They were so excited about this 200-year-old chair. Except that nobody can sit in it and nobody can touch it. Because it's a 200-year-old chair. And if somebody sits in it, it's going to go, it's going to splat. Like, and you can't, we don't want to destroy a 200-year-old chair. Like, because an 8-year-old sat in it. Okay. Everything in this life becomes a 200-year-old chair at some point. Like, things fall apart and they break. Everything that I own stays here when I die. The only thing that matters is the souls of men. And so how much of my time and how much of my money am I investing in things that matters? Jesus says in verse uh, 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Like, what... What does it mean to follow Jesus? It means to follow him into his sacrificial, self-denying lifestyle. That we need to follow Jesus into a lifestyle that says other people are more important than we are. And that means I'm going to spend my time in a way that reflects a value for the souls of men and not for one that, like, this is me, me, and me. I'm not looking out for number one. It means that I'm going to deny myself in my marriage so that my, I can bless my wife on a daily basis. And an ideal marriage, which we aren't, but we're working towards Okay, uh, is when both of them do that. When, when two spouses together say, I'm going to look out for your needs, and she says, I'm going to look out for your needs, I, that, that creates a pretty ideal marriage because you're serving one another well. Like, we're supposed to deny ourselves when it comes to how we handle our money. It means mm, if I buy that big truck, I'm going to be in the heart of the car payments at $600 a month for the next 72 months. Like, and that's going to affect my giving because I'm not going to be able to tithe well. Okay, well... That's poor stewardship. Like, and that's not a life of self-denial. Like, I used to sell cars, full disclosure. Like, and once I, I had, I was not a good car salesman because I kept telling people, you can't afford this. Like, don't buy it. That doesn't work well when you get a commission sales, you know. Like, hey, like, you really need to buy this car because it fits your budget. And they're like, but I want this one because it has all the bells and whistles. I'm like, but your budget says you can afford this one. And then they walk out and they're like, oh, like that, trust me, self-denial does not happen much at a car lot, okay? That's just not a place where that happens. Like, I just want, you just watch it over and over again. You just like, I didn't last very long um, in the car sales business. Like, because it's a place of excess. Like, it's a place where we buy more than we need. Like, uh, it's a place where we buy more than we can afford. Like, but we don't deny ourselves there. Like, Jesus says, he must follow me in a life of self-denial. And where I am, my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Which is the promise of this. That ultimately, the Father is going to honor those who have lived a self-sacrificial life. That it is not for nothing. 
It's what we're called to as followers of Jesus. We are called to a life of self-denial and putting the needs of others in front of our own. And that's, that's painful because dying to self is always going to be painful. Like, and we live in a society that's driven by look out for number one, and we are live in a society that's driven by my feelings make my decisions. If I feel like it, I do it. If I don't feel like it, I don't. Um, and if you only follow Jesus when you feel like it, if you only deny yourself when you feel like it, you will rarely deny yourself. And you will rarely serve your spouse, your kids, your neighbors, the lost in a way that reflects Christ's love for others. Like, no. I'm on verse 26, and I'm going to land this plane, because if I don't, we're going to be here till 1 o'clock. And I will pick up in verse 27 next week, um, just because I, I, Meredith and I had this conversation, middle like, ah, where am I going to break the text? Like, I'm going to go, nope, I'm not. I'm just not going to get there, because otherwise we'll be here till 1.30, and I love you too much for that. I would rather you listen to the next part of the sermon. So we will, uh, I, I, I'm, just reality, I love you, like, enough to go, all right, I'm going to be selfless, and I'm going to land the plane right here. <laughs> and, and we will pick this back up uh, with Jesus talking about glorifying himself next week. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, uh, you are gracious, and you are good. Father, you love us even though we don't deserve it. You uh, empower us to love others. And Lord, I pray that even this week you would reveal the places in our hearts where we are uh, being driven by I wants. And I pray that every time the I want thought comes to mind this week, that you would help us to ask ourselves the question, am I living a life of self-denial? Am I putting this other person's needs in front of my own? Lord, I pray that you would empower us through the Holy Spirit to live Christ-like lives, like that consider others more important than ourselves, that you would break down the divisions in our minds between how we treat others in person and how we treat others on the internet. I pray that you would break down the divisions in our minds between how we treat others that we know in our families and those who are from outside, like, and that like Jesus embracing the Greeks who are outsiders, that you would empower us to embrace outsiders who are different from us, but who, have a, but who have souls just like us. Lord, I pray that more than anything, you would help us to grasp the value of the souls of men and give us a heart that beats like yours to see people come to know you. Lord, I pray that this week you would make us more like Jesus, make us more selfless, empower us to share, other, to share Christ with others. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.